halo e papa honua. Mai aina e ola mai. Halo e mahiena. E kuhi mana e ike mai. Halo e mahiena nui. Mai ka bo e ike au. Halo e ka ako e mana o pono e na au. Halo. Thank you, Creator, for blessing us all. Thank you to the sky, Father, and to the Spirit in the water. Thank you to the Grandfather's Son and to the woman who is deceased. And thank you to the Earth Mother. Kalani for starting us off in such a right way. Um, we have also here Auntie Shirley, who was in our last webinar. And I, um, I'm hoping that she'll be willing to say a couple of words um, to get us going here. Right. Well, mahalo for the invitation to join with all of you. I enjoyed the last visit with you and um it just gives me great pleasure knowing that love of ulu is being spread all over wherever it can be possible to do it and uh, the goodness of ulu and good luck everyone and have a good day and I'm glad to be here with you. Aloha. Aloha, Aloha to Shirley. Well, thank you everyone for being here. This is certainly a wonderful event for um, all of us here on my farm, considering we had almost 400 people register for this webinar from all over the world. And we also have speakers from all over the Pacific. So thank you so much to uh, PFON and the Breadfruit People uh, organizers and those who have conceived of bringing us all together in this way. And we've been um, dealing with a little bit of technical issues here and there, uh, which are inherent, I suppose, in such a widespread uh, group of presenters and attendees and uh, all, all of that. So I hope the technology goes well. If it doesn't, um, if something is uh, having a problem, please let us know in the uh, chat box. We also have Caitlin Mahoney here and she can um, help, help with the technical issues. So I'll just remind you um, that uh, just as in the last webinar, please, as you think of your questions, please add them to the Q&A box. You can see at the bottom of your screen, there's a, uh, an icon with Q&A underneath it. So please uh, um, put your questions in the Q&A box so that we can attend to them after all the speakers have 
have uh, given their presentations. Um, the chat box is more for comments, hellos, and that kind of thing. Today we're focusing on breadfruit in agroforestry systems. And we're extremely fortunate to have um, uh, three speakers, uh, four including me, who have uh, quite a bit of experience in this area. And so the theme today is breadfruit agroforestry. Before we begin, I would like um, to invite Kyle Stice, the, um, the managing director of uh, um, breadfruit people, to say a few words. So uh, since he seems to be out, I don't know, that doesn't look like a very, um, uh, you know, pleasant office to me, but, <laughs> Uh, um, and I will show a slide that um, uh, Kyle just sent me. So let me pull that up and you please begin, Kyle. Well, thank you, Craig, and hello to everyone. Uh, it's great to uh, have such great panelists uh, today and uh, people that um, uh, we admire very much and we're so fortunate that uh, the breadfruit people is uh, bringing together uh, experts like yourself and um, also the resources that, uh, that you all bring to the table. So that's what breadfruit people really is about. It's about bringing uh, people and resources together. Uh, and I'm um, uh, very happy to announce that our uh, website is live. Uh, it is uh, breadfruitpeople.com and um, Craig is going to put up a, um, a slide uh, to give you a little bit of a indication about what you can find there. Uh, but essentially, uh, we are trying to be uh, a consolidator of some of the uh, amazing resources that are out there. Um, some we are uh, aiming to produce new and original materials uh, with all of your help. Uh, but uh, primarily, we're, we're collecting and, and, and bringing uh, a repository of uh, resources, recipes, videos, so that uh, uh, practitioners can can find these uh, um, uh, resources and make good use of them. Uh, we also are trying to highlight some of our breadfruit champions. So as you go on the website, you'll be able to uh, uh, see and, and virtually meet some of the breadfruit champions uh, and, um, and in, in time uh, be able to connect, hopefully not just over Zoom, but we're looking forward to breadfruit people uh, becoming uh, uh, more than just a virtual community uh, when the world starts to go back to normal. But um, there's uh, places where you can also uh, subscribe, like type in your email address. And uh, we have um, uh, e-bulletins that we're sending out. Uh, and that's to, again, to highlight uh, activities, uh, events, new resources. So uh, please go onto the website, breadfruitpeople.com and uh, type in your email address and, and subscribe. Uh, we'd love uh, to have any new content that you think is uh, relevant to this, uh, this big community. So please send us an email, uh, uh, info at breadfruitpeople.com uh, or uh, write us a message on Facebook. Uh, we're at Breadfruit People. Uh, also, you can like us on, uh, on Facebook and we're gonna be uh, able to kind of uh, share, uh, again, resharing uh, some of the partners work and, and just getting everybody connected in a virtual sense. So um, thanks again for this time, Craig. And uh, uh, we're so fortunate to, uh, to, to be able to, to still connect. Uh, yeah, my office is not a conventional one, but this is not conventional times. So we, uh, this is the season for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, we're still working on pulling up that image. When you speak at the very end, um, We'll try to show that uh, breadfruit people image. Okay, okay. So uh, let us begin with the pre presentations. And uh, our first presenter is Father Pedro from, um, he's the director of the Tutu Rural Training Center on the island of Tabiuni in Fiji. And Father Pedro oversees an extensive farming and education program. Tutu is at the forefront of agroforestry research and development of key crops such as teak, kava, and breadfruit. So um, I'll leave it to Father Pedro to begin speaking. 
were you were you going to share your screen or do you want me to share uh, from here I'll share it from here Gray. Bulubinaka, everyone, and uh, welcome to our, our second uh, session for, for bre uh, breadful people who are interested to promote this uh, so called uh, the crop for the future. Um, today, my, my topic will be you know, on uh, the, the roots of uh, agroforestry and its mission to revitalize. And I'll be talking from uh, our experience here in Tutu. Uh, the topics uh, are mainly on uh, the incorporation of agroforestry into uh, Tutu Rural Training Center course, uh, reducing the risk of uh, the two commodity. Uh, introducing of sandalwood uh, and teak, and then uh, moving forward to incorporating of breadfruits as uh, the crop for the future, uh, and the lessons uh, learned from uh, the productions of uh, breadfruit. Um, in, in, in recent uh, years, uh, Tutu Rural Training Center has a uh, focus uh, is training around management uh, as well as uh, um, human development. Uh, trainees, uh, are normally they, they, they grow uh, crops which they are familiar uh, with and for, for them, uh, they are enabled to est establish the, it was derived from the established marketing system. Uh, the main crops uh, for the trainees are kava, ngona, and taro, ondaro. Uh, for them, taro provides uh, an ongoing uh, cash flows for the participants, uh, and ngona provides uh, a substantial amount for investment purpose uh, at the end of the three years uh, program. Eh? Uh, in, in that sense, they were able to uh, achieves what they have uh, outlined in their five-year uh, life development plan. Uh, the introduction of high-value crop uh, based on this established marketing system, uh, it's, it's been a fail from uh, our part. Uh, we managed to try uh, the different uh, methods, but uh, unsuccessful. Uh, and we have uh, seen from uh, our years of experience that both uh, Ndalo and uh, Yangona, uh, Taro and, uh, and Kawa bring same uh, uh, risk, eh? they inherit risk with them. So our way that um, uh, uh, has been helping us moving forward in consultation with our expert like uh, Lex Thompson, I acknowledge Alex and uh, Rohit Lal, Mr. Sankumar, uh, Andrew McGregor, uh, Kyle Stice. Uh, they, they've uh, helped us and, uh, to lessen or to, to, to reduce the amount of risk on these two commodities. So this is a natural disaster risk, which uh, we've, uh, uh, we, we, we've encountered and we've, uh, from our ex experience, through the promotions of uh, sustainable agricultural practices, uh, it's the, the appropriate uh, diversification. So, um, so uh, uh, agroforestry is, is seen as an important part of this um, uh, sustainable diversification mix. So from our side, we believe that agro agroforestry uh, offers uh, participants opportunity to earn 
a significant long-term income to meet a future uh, family and uh, other needs. Eh? So from uh, what we've been uh, incorporating these two commodities into uh, the sustainable farming practices, it's not only uh, helping the participants at large, but as well as helping the sustainable of uh, the causes here at the training center. So regenerate uh, the soil uh, at the same time, uh, giving uh, a force income for the participants. In, in that sense, we've been uh, supplying planting material to these participants. In our case, uh, what's being incorporated in our course is the uh, sandalwood as well as uh, teak. So the, the introduction of teak and, uh, and, and sandalwood as uh, we can have uh, from uh, our, our discussions as well from our own experience. And this is uh, uh, for sandalwood, it's being exploited. Eh? Uh, and now we are planting it into orchards so that we can, it can be a, a seedling, a seed source for our participants. And thanks uh, to ACR team, who team up with the Ministry of Forestry, uh, leading with uh, Dr. Ma, uh, Thompson. Uh, they are the one who's been guiding us uh, so that we, we established uh, a seeds, um, a gene conservation site for, for sandalwood. So that's been uh, an ongoing uh, practices. But at the same time, from the lots we have, we are disseminating it to our uh, participants for that they can incorporate it into their home program or in their home farm. Uh, that is for for teak and at the, for for sandalwood. And at the same time, uh, this is our sixth year. Uh, for if you can see in the, the photos there, those are our teak farm uh, with the help of Basil and Lex Thompson. We incorporated it into the teak uh, the tutu program. Uh, we've been uh, supplying uh, seeds to our participants, uh, uh, teaching them how to sow. Uh, and the different methods that they can follow. Uh, and, and thanks to the ideas being shared by those who've been uh, helping us uh, in this project. And then um, the, our teak farm, uh, teak now with all the thinnings that is being done, we, it's, it's, it's being limited, but we are preserving our best trees. And these are the ones who will be our our seed source, which will be, we need to get uh, the quality seeds from uh, the mother plant and then reestablish again uh, an orchard. So from there, we can uh, disseminate the good seeds to our participants and to our neighboring uh, community. Um, then we would uh, team up with the uh, the Pacific uh, Breadfruit uh, Projects in collaboration with them uh, using our network, we managed to move out into uh, the, uh, the um, island of Onoilegu, as well as here in Tabiwini, sourcing out uh, good planting material for the breadfruit uh, project. Uh, the advice being given by the Pacific Breadfruit uh, Project team was really helpful for us that we enables us to establish our own uh, orchard. And uh, from the initial uh, beginning, we managed to establish our breadfruit boulevard. And then from there, we continue to mark out, doing a mark out and teaching our participants to propagate more planting materials. And at the same time, we lo uh, look out to our a catchment area where the breadfruit is only grown. So on the, the slides, you can see the areas in Bonoilevu uh, and Tavuni where normally we get our planting material from. And, and uh, through this catchment, uh, through our network here in this catchment area, we enable us to try to source our planting material slowly and gather it. But the, the drawbacks is the the, the biosecurity part. Uh, now we can get a planting material 
and then go over to Savu Savu will be somewhere over here uh, through the biosecurity. They can do all the, uh, the their work and there will be uh, force will be clear to bring the planting material over to Tavio. Um, in uh, the ongoing supply of this planting material, uh, it's graduation. We normally uh, give our participants uh, a, a, what you call a, a, a pot of breadfruit, makoret breadfruit. Uh, this is just to uh, maybe extend uh, our network over to, to them, uh, where, they, where we can source breadfruit whenever, like in the bigger picture, if this uh, uh, is being, there's a more development taking place in regards to uh, breadfruit as a whole. So uh, thanks to, to those who have been uh, journeying with us, uh, enabling us to mark out uh, the breadfruit uh, we are on site. And upon graduation, not only the young farmers, the single women, the farming couples course, we disseminate the planting materials over to them. Uh, seeing that uh, the good thing that uh, we are getting out from, from breadfruit as whole. Or uh, then the process taken for the processing of uh, the breadfruit as a raw material uh, done by Kaitu, Arecito and others and their team. So we managed to establish our food processing unit. So from being a manual, as you can see in the photos, uh, using the, what we have over here before we got the machines, uh, it's, it's handy. So these are the, the ways that we thought, uh, we, we teach our, our participants uh, while we, they move over to the food processing unit. And these are the manuals uh, that they can, uh, the, the, the ways they can do it at home on uh, the processing of uh, breadfruit, the value additions of breadfruit. Uh, um, and, and these are the, some of the products uh, that uh, comes out from uh, the breadfruit. Uh, and recently uh, we did our food tasting on breadfruit uh, that um, we managed to get a few from where we are, like this slide, we have developed more into another variety, uh, uh, which uh, we've seen that uh, this can help our local community to get out from the traditional knowledge, seeing breadfruit as uh, the, uh, the stable food for those who don't have uh, more uh, in their home garden. So breadfruit is a way, a way forward. And we can see that uh, it gives, there's a lot of, uh, uh, what you call, there's a lot of things in uh, the breadfruit as, as a whole. And you can see the, the breadfruit fries, um, uh, people love this. This can be uh, one of the commodities that they can change the lunchbox of uh, their children. Uh, instead of the cooked one, the, the normal, the use of traditional ways of cooking, these are the new methods that uh, we've discovered. Uh, they can even, uh, fill up uh, the lunchbox of our children uh, whenever they go over to school. The breadfruit slice, these are all commodities, just breadfruit and coconut. I mean, the other uh, ingredients that's being uh, put, uh, add on to the commodity itself. Breadfruit meat pie. Uh, these are, are the innovative ways that uh, we try to pump uh, the idea over to the local community or to the participants. Uh, when we have the food taste, uh, they were being invited and try to change their traditional knowledge and understanding of how they can um, uh, move forward in the productions of breadfruit. Um, breadfruit chips, which we, will, we continue to do, uh, the breadfruit bread. Uh, interesting uh, in here, we, we, we follow the method is being put forward by uh, Dr. I, I forgot his name, Dr. Tusi. Uh, the mixing of breadfruit flour and uh, bread uh, and, and coconut. Uh, thanks to that knowledge and we acknowledge uh, the sharing of uh, uh, the, the ideas we managed to, we, 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 we we come to know that these two when you mix together, 
it form the texture or the dough uh, that we are looking for. Uh, apart from uh, this bread food bun, this is only bread food. Uh, we need to have a good uh, mix. Uh, you handle it with care, then you can have uh, a dough like that. Uh, and then for, for this two, you need to leave it for an hour before you do all your processing. Uh, the thing is, we, we've come up with a solution and, and we can really bank this. This is one way forward, uh, like here in Fiji, we are on lockdown, instead of importing wheat over from overseas, this is our way forward. Um, uh, breadfruit, the crop for the future, as being a, a, a theme for a long time when we all try to uh, earmark uh, the, uh, the commodity. Uh, these are all the, uh, the bakings from uh, breadfruit flour. And for our way forward, we, see we need, really need to continue on with the orchard planting. Uh, we only use the Rimbali kind of variety because of its uh, white texture. Uh, we are trying to get away the, the, the fruiting pattern from the Ministry of Agriculture here in Fiji, as well as with uh, Mr. Kaitu and Levi. Uh, we're trying to source all the varieties of breadfruit over, and we'll try the different uh, uh, varieties. Uh, and it's, it, the important things we need to uh, plant uh, the uh, breadfruit uh, planting material in orchard. Uh, we need to have more awareness, community awareness, the changing of mindset, uh, that this is uh, uh, something good that you can, instead of uh, relying on the, the use of uh, taro and cassava, uh, breadfruit comes into place and the other value added. Uh, that you can do out of uh, the commodity, the single of a commodity breadfruit. Um, there should be other trials on uh, the varieties of uh, breadfruit uh, and uh, this is sustainable supply of raw material. So at this stage, the impact of um, um, Cyclone Yasa and Cyclone Ana, we have uh, run shortage of uh, what's called the supply of uh, uh, breadfruit. Uh, so thanks, we will have we have our own supply, the dried uh, breadfruit, sliced breadfruit, that we managed to continue on uh, doing uh, uh, breadfruit flour, but in a lower um, uh, supply, like uh, not like the usual way. So that's why we managed to do our breadfruit uh, tasting and we're getting because of the raw materials that we continue to preserve for, for the center. So for us uh, here, we really believe that this is something that we can go forward and continue to uh, produce in a large scale, as well as try to have more awareness to the local community. Uh, we're using our network with our participants so that uh, to change enables them to change their mindset, and then we can uh, uh, be in in line with the the breadfruit people uh, project. So I'm I'm glad that we are moving forward with this. And and, and, and first of all, before we can earmark on uh, the promoting of breadfruit, we need really needs that uh, the agroforestry as well as the agroforestry agroforestry is in line with the promotion or the sustaining of uh, our environment and the breadfruit trees with its uh, canopy uh, this is a way forward that it can uh, help uh, in um, uh, the promotions of a healthy environment as well as uh, the carbon uh, bank uh, and uh, others that we have uh, uh, come to to know at this time so breadfruit the crop for the future and I thank you all for, for, for listening and I'll be ready for, to answer some of those questions uh, that uh, in, in, in regards to my presentation. Thank you very much, sir. Vinaka, Father Pedro, and for that very interesting uh, update on your activities and your work in agroforestry. 
Thank you so much. Um, let's see. I think that perhaps, can I stop the screen sharing? Oh, here we go. Thank you. Um, so we, our next speaker, we're very pleased to have here with us, Peter Kao from Vanuatu. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Peter is the managing director of the Farm Support Association. And he has extensive experience in designing and consulting and conducting farmer research and extension, developing farmer extension materials, organics, developing young farmers courses and working with youth and women to improve their livelihoods. Excuse me. And today um, we have uh, Peter's um, presentation recorded. So uh, if it's okay with you, Peter, I'll just uh, start that from here. Let's see, you can unmute. Yes, yes, Craig, please. Uh, uh, can you start it from your end? Um, I'll sit back and uh, take any questions. Yes, thank you. And, and you reminded me to remind our attendees Please put your questions in the Q&A box, which is marked Q&A. And I noticed there's a few comments in the chats. So that's wonderful. Uh, I don't see any questions yet. So as, as questions come to mind, please add them to the Q&A box. And when all presentations are finished, we will handle uh, your questions. And we're very thankful to have you here, Peter, live to handle questions as well. So. Um, if you just bear with me for a moment, I am gonna start Peter's um, presentation. So, sorry. Um, Hello, my name is uh, Peter Kao from uh, Vanuatu. My paper is on traditional agroforestry in Vanuatu that includes breadfruit. This paper is put together by Kao Julian, who is the fellow researcher from our research station here in Vanuatu, Dr. Lebo Fenson, who is our Sira researcher here in Vanuatu and myself, Peter Kao. Firstly, I would like to compare planting of breadfruit and how it fits into our cropping system. The cropping system found in Vanuatu is mainly root crop based. This means fruit trees apart from banana, such as breadfruit and other fruiting and nut trees apart from coconuts, are additives to the root crop based system here in Vanuatu. This means that fruit trees excluding coconuts and banana are not first priority but roots are. Second, the breadfruit diversity in Vanuatu, comparing northern islands to the southern islands. Vanuatu islands consist of about 83 islands spread over a wider uh, mass area over the sea, stretching from the north of New Caledonia to the south of Solomon Islands. In general, the diversity is larger in the Northern Islands than in the Southern Islands. For example, Malo alone in the northern part of Vanuatu has more than 100 cultivars according to the research. That are known, whereas 
only 10 or so occur in Tongoa in the southern islands. This, this means that where there is more diversity, the crop is widely used and is more referred to as stable food. Third, city type against seedless type. In Vanuatu, the seeded forms are very abundant, while the paternocopic seedless clones are rare. Four, differentiating between different types by any Vanuatu farmers. In Vanuatu, its community recognizes different cultivars according to the size of the tree, the shape of the leaves, the size and the shape of the fruit, the presence or the absence of spines on the fruit and its color, the color, texture and taste of the flesh, the number of seeds and the fruiting season. A few seedless forms, triploids, have been found in Vanuatu but the country appears to be an important center for diversity of breadfruit and a key locality for its domestication. Farmers select genotypes found in the forest and plant them around their houses using root cuttings. The number of distinct cultivars varies according to species and to locations. For example, some communities in the northern of Vanuatu can distinguish up to 100 different morphotypes of breadfruit, according to Walter 1989. 5. Breadfruit season. The peak season is from the period October to April. It is a stable food for islands with greater diversity, as mentioned earlier, the Northern Islands. 6. Domestication of breadfruit by the farmers. There are numerous local varieties of breadfruit in Vanuatu, and most or all of them are still in the process of being dom domesticated. The domestication process can be summarized as follows. Selection of wild genotype or seedling from a cultivated form, the domesticator identifies a protective morphotype and tastes its fruits. If the quality is acceptable, a volunteer plant, a seedling root shoots from the mother plant, or a seed from the fruit collected from the mother plant. For breadfruit, clonal propagation is possible. Improvement of the environment, the soil where the young plant is planted is well prepared. Unlike the mother plant, the seedling is planted into a considerably modified environment the soil is loosened and weeds and sats around the trees are cleared off. This improvement, this improved environment contributes directly to the enlarged development of the selected genotype, its canopy development and the fruiting aptitude. Improvement of the population composed of well-established selected seedling weeds are going to in the cross in a modified environment. In Vanuatu or Melanesia, many cultivars of breadfruit, for example, are simply clones of edible wild forms and a few putative wild forms are probably feral plants that escape from the cultivation or survivors found in secondary forest in locations where villages existed in the past. Some cultivars are also clones of hybrids between the wild forms and feral or cultivated plants. Selection always operates on the most prolific and vigorous trees and figure is often associated with heterocycosity and or heteritic effect. Over the long term, the continuous selection of the largest, sweetest, Le least. It is a form of recruitment selection with very long cycles. Very often, the person who starts the selection process 
may not be the one who will reap the benefits of the genetic improvement. 7. Selection of types to plan by Nifanuatu as a practice seen here. Farmers observe slight variations in form, taste, color, and size of the foods that they are consuming and have a marked tendency to conserve its distinct morphotype for preference, necessity, or pretense purposes. Sometimes just for the sake of having orchids exhibition variation. Some farmers have developed their own collections that include morphotypes not known to other people and that they will use to exchange with new ones, thereby increasing their diversity. They also preserve them by necessity because some are early while others are late mature, maturing, thereby extending the consumption period. Certain morphotypes of breadfruit also cook more rapidly than others. Since all do not have the same taste, each one is therefore a slightly different food. The practice of selecting and assembling the best morphotype have resulted in a major transformation of the landscape. The fruiting trees are found mainly in or near villages, gathered into small clusters near subsistence gardens whose boundaries they mark. They are often assembled in orchids representing an artificial population composed of different provinces where flow of chains is not control but obviously efficient at generating diversity. Obviously the most appreciated morphotypes are propagated more frequently than the others and are therefore more abundant. 8. Planting breadfruit in the agroforestry system Ni Vanuatu traditional practice. Planting Planting fruit trees such as breadfruit is an additive to root crop based system. This means that breadfruit trees and other fruit trees are planted mainly as secondary crop and on areas such as one around the food crop, garden boundaries to mark the boundaries or ownership of the land, two along the road and no footpath. Three around the village edges in clusters. Four sometimes in the yards. And five in secondary forests where they usually indicate a site of early settlement and or an earlier food garden land. Lastly, but not the least, nine Vanuatu Agriculture Research and Technical Center work on breadfruit. The research has collected and morphologically characterized up to 63 accessions from some islands and have established a collection plot in the research station. All of these accessions are characterized as CD types. In my presentation, you will find below an example of the characterization that the research have taken. The main focus for the research are 1. Development of genetic resources 2. Characterization 3. Nutritional analysis 4. Contact DNA fingerprint 5. Find which type fruits more than once a year and which ones are not. Next steps for the research to continue to collect and characterize as much as we can from the islands to be able to know how many kinds do we have. Second, the same breadfruit can be called a different name from one island to another. So the research will only confirm this after characterizing. Three, identify which types have no seeds, no flesh oxidization, low bearing plants are not much suits from the roots. Fourth, find techniques to propagate 
and do cross free. Six, find chemical composition for each type. Seven, teach the farmers of pruning the trees to bear fruits lower. Also safe during disasters such as cyclones. Eight, once we feel that our work is more favorable, then we may look <coughs> at value adding or processing, which hopefully will trigger mass planting. Nine, at this stage, it is likely that all types that we have may be seedy. If so, then we may need to get seedless varieties from other neighboring pigs. In conclusion, farmers' research on breadfruit has been done to date and will continue into the future, but on small scale or at the farm level. The scientific research on breadfruit in Vanuatu has just started. It is still working on identifying and describing what and how many types do we have here in Vanuatu. This is the end of my presentation, my paper. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you for pre-recording that so that we avoided any technical difficulties during the presentation. Thank you, Greg, for your great help for putting that together. You're more than welcome. Let's move on to our next presenter. Uh, this is Dr. Lex Thompson, who is Associate Adjunct Professor in Pacific Islands Agribusiness and Agroforestry at the University of the Sunshine Coast and is Pacific Reforestation Scientific Advisor. He has worked extensively on forestry and agroforestry in 30 countries. Let's face it, Lex is everywhere. everywhere. Everywhere you go, you find Lex. And it's just a pleasure to have Lex here to present on, on his experience of agroforestry throughout the Pacific. Uh, might start Bulavanaka all participants, lovely to see uh, people there like Adelino, who I haven't had contact for years, and uh, uh, Kiarana, Danny in uh, Cook Islands, and uh, Bulsa Danny, Danny Hunter, and all of my friends in Fiji. There's so many, I don't think I can go through them all, but uh, really great to have you. And aloha to all the, the participants from uh, Hawaii, uh, uh, Malo Lele to anyone from Tonga, uh, and uh, Hello for Lava, Samoan participants. It's really great to have you all. Um, so I might, I'm just wondering, Craig, uh, will you share my presentation or will Caitlin do that? Or do you want, I'll just share the screen from here. I'll try. See if it'll work. Is it coming up, Craig? Is it there? Okay. Um, should it be on the slideshow or? Yes, uh, go ahead and do slideshow. Yes, uh, go ahead and do slideshow. That's the highlight slideshow. Okay, so. Uh, it's going to be a fairly wide ranging presentation. Craig's asked me to really stick to talking about agroforestry, which I'll try to do uh, traditional agro, Bedford agroforestry systems, but uh, I'll go through some of the other. Uh, uh, now, how do I go to the next slide here? Um, okay. If you just, it. Yeah. There you go. Seems to be working, yeah. Uh, so, how oh, the screen is covered. Yeah, breadfruit's a, a very high yielding and low input food staple uh, tree that's cultivated now throughout the wet tropics. And from my perspective, I believe it will become the most important tree 
uh, food tree in the global wet tropics. Uh, there's there's a whole lot of reasons for that. Uh, every every portion of the breadfruit tree has yielded useful materials to Pacific Islanders, uh, mainly as a source of carbohydrates, but also for production of um, timber, for production of medicines, for production of fibre. You, you can go through this. There's many different uses of breadfruit. Uh, also, it's one of 33, uh, 35 crop species that have been identified for their potential to enhance uh, food security under the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources. So this is important because it means that uh, it's easier to share uh, material of genetic material of breadfruit under that treaty uh, and provide benefit back to the owners of that uh, IP. Uh, breadfruit is present on almost all inhabited tropical Pacific islands, but its significance as a food crop can vary. Certainly a major food source in uh, Micronesia and on atolls. Uh, this is, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the reasons why it's become very important on the atolls. It's also a significant food source in uh, Southeast Solomon Islands, Santa Cruz Reef Islands. Uh, Peter's mentioned in Vanuatu, particularly places like Malo and the Torres and Banks Islands. Also in the Marquesas, uh, very important in Samoa and other atolls such as Tokelau and Tuvalu. Now, breadfruit is grown traditionally in uh, agroforestry systems with a whole range of other food crops and often ornamental plants. These include coconuts, different types of taro, the colocasia, which is your most common taro, uh, uh, xanthosoma taro, cytosperma taro, uh, Alocasia taro. Also, it's grown with sweet potatoes, banana jam, sugarcane, pandanus, and many other uh, tree species, too many to, to mention here. Okay, I just want to um, go a little bit in. Uh, Peter gave a very good example of domestication of breadfruit in Vanuatu. So, normally uh, looking at the, the top uh, left screen, you see the, the wild form of breadfruit, which has been called Articarpus commansi or bread nut. The true name should be Articarpus altus. It's a diploid and it's very, very seedy. Then if you move from, that's found in uh, mainly in New Guinea and perhaps in the neighboring uh, Bismarck archipelago. Then with domestication, as you move into uh, Melanesia and Western Polynesia, you get these seeded uh, varieties of, of just few seeded varieties of, of uh, Articarpus altus uh, or uh, breadfruit. Uh, some of them uh, then they were domesticated further, moving across into Eastern Polynesia, where you have sterile uh, triploids, which have a high proportion of starch and less seed. I don't think we should all necessarily think of uh, seed as a bad thing in breadfruit. I know that uh, I can remember in Fiji, one of my first experiences of eating breadfruit was cooked up partly seedy uh, breadfruit and the, the Fijians gave the, the cooked seeds to the kids to eat as a little treat. And they, they, they tasted to me like uh, fava beans and they're a bit higher in protein than the other parts of the breadfruit. So seediness uh, is not necessarily a problem. And of course it's needed if you want to breed breadfruit. Then the other uh, two species, uh, quite exciting, we've got a, another new species of breadfruit, which I'll talk about in a minute, but the other main species of breadfruit was the Articarpus marianensis uh, from Palau in the Northern Mariana Islands. And uh, that one very early on, probably in sort of the, almost the Lapita days, 3000 years ago or so, uh, hybrids were created between Articarpus altus uh, and Articarpus, Articarpus marianensis. And, these hybrids are incredibly important for the Northern Pacific because they introduced some characteristics of Marianensis, which are very important in terms of improved drought tolerance, uh, improved salinity tolerance, and so on. Uh, and also those early generation hybrids, they were also developed into seedless or sterile triploids that were are grown throughout Micronesia. And also they were um, moved into the Marquesas. Um, okay. Uh, this is a map showing uh, the distribution 
and dispersal and origins of, of the breadfruit complex. So you've got up here in Guam and Palau, you've got Articarpus marionensis. Uh, in New Guinea, you've got the Articarpus altalus. And just this year, we have a new species of breadfruit, which is Articarpus bergei. It's just been named in systematic botany. It comes from Maluku. And these crop wild ancestors are very important because we don't know what characteristics this uh, new species of breadfruit might have that might be useful and needed for future breeding, especially in a changing world where climate change and, and uh, there's new diseases and so on. Uh, now, uh, I probably won't go into this because I'll, I'll take up a lot of time, but you're welcome to, to study it. Um, you can see how breadfruit was domesticated from New Guinea and moved in Lapita times through to uh, Samoa and Tonga. And then much later, it was moved across into Tahiti. There was also some direct movement of cultivars from the Polynesian outliers off the coast of Solomons and uh, Papua New Guinea. And that, that was occurring probably 785 to 1,000 years ago that these uh, varieties were taken to Marquesas. Um, but I, I won't spend too much time on that because it's quite complicated. Uh, next one. I just wanted to mention that uh, when we're talking about agroforestry systems, the, the importance of this uh, genetic and varietal diversity uh, in that breadfruit complex, and that really underpins sustainable and productive agroforestry systems in what are often quite radically different environments in which we're growing breadfruit from possibly droughty uh, atoll environments right through to very wet uh, volcanic environments such as Tabiuni where Father uh, Patera and Samoa. Uh, so you can see the, these are the named varieties. As Peter mentioned, some of them may be duplicates, but you can see an enormous amount of uh, domestication and selection of varieties in Fiji, Ponape, uh, Tahiti, uh, Solomons, Vanuatu. Uh, and these uh, desirable varieties have been widely distributed in ancient times, but also in modern times. So it can be hard to work out how they've moved around, but uh, I see I see Craig yawning, so I better get on agroforestry. Uh, this this one, the photo is quite interesting variety, Maopo, and you, then you can see the different names of this same variety. So it's my Alcarpe in uh, Makiz, it's Utu Lolo in Fiji, Marawa in Cook Islands. Uh, uh, Oh, sorry, I've gone the wrong way. Uh, I think Peter's spoken a lot about the situation in Vanuatu, so I won't... Uh, uh, sorry. Go, go much into this about the domestication, but uh, just to say that there are some... Uh, we found in our studies that breadfruit was ranked as the most important... Uh, cultivated tree in the banks and torus groups and that there's an average of 17 trees per household and very importantly they've developed techniques for uh, through fermentation through preserving the breadfruit so that's important uh, it's no no good having a lot of uh, breadfruit trees if you don't know and uh, particularly if there are a limited number of varieties if you don't know how to preserve them and keep them um let's go on one at a time Uh, breadfruit also used as a timber in Vanuatu. Uh, so it's covering up my screen with this. Uh, <laughs> but uh, breadfruit, I think where I really uh, sort of fell in love with breadfruit was actually in, in uh, Samoa, uh, visiting, uh, this is in Tolosina Puli. He's now the, uh, the head of forestry in Samoa, but visiting his village and just seeing how breadfruit was being grown there in, in Samoa and the, uh, the way it's being used. Um, the, the, the trees are uh, found growing in, in almost all gardens in Samoa. They're, they're very well suited to rocky uh, volcanic substrates where it can be quite difficult to find a space to grow or plant a root crop. Uh, once again, uh, Samoa has numerous uh, cultivars, often seedless triploids, 
and they're grown with many other crops such as bananas and you'll see them grown with almost every ornamental there in some mower. Uh, I'm just having a problem with the screen. Uh, the characteristic umu where the, the breadfruit is baked in the umu. Now, I just wanted to say one thing about breadfruit. The first time I ate breadfruit, I was so disappointed. I had this, uh, I love eating bread and I love fruit and I thought breadfruit was going to be great. <laughs> but it, BGNs, uh, they, they weren't the women, the blokes, they cooked up this breadfruit and they, they cooked it and they, it was just this soggy mess and it was awful. And when you, when you cook breadfruit, there's lots of great ways to cook it, but I think some of the Polynesian ways is baking in the stone oven, but also the way the Ratumans do it is really, really fan special. Eh? The, the way they'll get the breadfruit, they might have it in their kitchen, they'll keep it and they'll wait till it's just the perfect ripeness to cook it and then they'll, they'll roast it or something. And it, it just tastes perfect. It's a uh, beautiful texture if it's the right variety, beautiful texture. Maybe it can have a slight sweetness. Uh, so yeah, the way you cook and use breadfruit is really important. Sorry. Uh, using the leaves as wrappings. I really like this. We live in an age where we've got so much plastic and awful uh, things that we're putting into the environment and the, the way that Pacific Islanders uh, use, use leaves, for example, for wrapping and it's all biodegradable. I love that. Um, uh, sorry, I'm in a bit of trouble here. Uh, Craig asked me to focus on the agroforestry systems. There's, there's not terribly much to the traditional systems. <laughs> they're, they're, they're often, they're, they're not very actively managed. They, they tend to put lots of different crops and things together. Uh, sometimes they're more actively managed. This is a fairly uh, simple system in uh, Tonga. That's, I believe, the variety Kia, which is probably one of these Marianensis uh, hybrids that's come down from uh, from Kiribati down to Wallace and Fortuna, and then the, the Tongans brought it from Wallace and Fortuna, and that's where they got the name May, because it's really unusual that you've got these two different names, uh, types of common name for breadfruit in the Pacific. One's May or Mai in the Northern Pacific, and then you've got Ulu or Kulu or something like that in the Uru in the South uh, Southern Pacific. But you can see it growing there with uh, bananas and with cassava. And by growing these crops together, you can really maximise the amount of productivity on a certain piece of land. You can reduce your, your risk of pests, uh, pests and disease and so on. Uh, you can see there, there's obviously been a quite a severe cyclone or wind event that's shredded the banana leaves, but uh, the breadfruit's looking quite good. Oh. Hopefully we'll come up to the next one. Okay. Um, in Fiji, uh, Father Patero has covered quite a bit of this, but when we did our uh, rapid rural appraisal studies, we found that breadfruit was the most important tree species in the two main islands of Fiji, together with coconut. It had the highest ranking uh, on Viti Levu and Vanua Levu. This is one of those areas in uh, northeast Vanua Levu that's supplying material to tutu that's the belly carna variety i think someone asked why is it the preferred varieties and their risks of growing just one variety and that's all true belly carna uh, is very well liked in fiji because it's a very flavorsome it's a small uh, uh, type of breadfruit around one not so good for processing because it's small but it's a really delicious breadfruit and that's one of the reasons why why fijians like and i think uh, father patero mentioned it has a particularly white flower which uh could be well liked if you, unless you want a, a wholemeal flower. So this is a, a, a traditional sort of garden where you've got a few breadfruit trees growing in Fiji. Um, associated plants can include almost anything, but in this case, uh, mango, papaya, some ornamentals like polyscyas and crotons are in there. And these are these systems are. I'll see if I can go to the next one. It's. Often the trees grow very tall. They can be, in wet areas, they can be 30 to 40 metres tall. It's quite a dangerous job and difficult job to harvest the fruits from these tall trees. Major losses to fruit bats and other birds and from spoilage. It's breadfruit, it goes quite quickly from being a mature fruit to through to a ripe and over mature fruit. So it's very hard to uh, 
collect most of the fruits produced in these sort of systems. So there's an interest, uh, I think, both in Hawaii, but also in Fiji for developing short statute breadfruit for food export and value added products. Uh, Pifon and Tutu are involved. That's on the right, that's um, Saint Kumar, who Father Patera mentioned. Uh, so in Tutu, they've been planting these selected varieties that have been marcotted. If you marcot a breadfruit, it tends to retain that smaller stature. Whereas if you grow it from a, a seed or from a, a root sucker, it will grow into quite a tall tree. But the marcotting, not all breadfruit varieties can be marcotted, but the ones that are amenable to marcotting, you'll get a, a more dwarfed type of mature tree. And if you can actively manage it through uh, more vigorous pruning and keep it to maybe a three or four metre height, it's very easy to harvest your, your, your breadfruit and get much more, a much more productive system. Uh, Father Patera mentioned the breadfruit. We also did a lot of work on that in uh, Fiji, and we found that the, the larger fruited varieties like Budo and Vula were much more efficient and easy to process uh, than things like uh, Balikana. We found that you can use the peel, the core, the seeds. They can be all processed to make a more of a wholemeal type of flour, which would be appealing to some people. Um, to produce breadfruit flour, it's a gluten-free flour. You need uh, quite access to cheap large quantities so you need to be either growing it yourself or if you're lucky enough to be in Samoa often at the end of the day on a Saturday market you can buy, buy breadfruit very cheaply. Uh, we also did successful trial of gluten-free uh, high quality protein breadfruit flour to Deeks Bakery in uh, Australia. Deeks is Robert De Costello, a very famous marathon runner and through their, their trials they found that of the gluten-free uh, uh, flowers, uh, like you can make gluten-free flour from bananas or you can make them from kamala, dalo, almost anything, but they found that the breadfruit flour was the most suitable for their bakery products. I'll talk a little bit about the uh, breadfruit uh, system in Rotuma. Uh, they have an average of about two to five breadfruit trees per, per farm and they grow it with many different crops. You can see it there. They also, uh, I think this is a system, and they may have got it uh, from Micronesia because it's used in the uh, Ponape. They, they also will uh, cut branches of it, could be fowl, the hibiscus, and they'll, they'll grow the um, yams into the, the canopy of the breadfruit. Uh, they'll also grow Xanthosoma tara, which is more shade tolerant underneath the canopy of the breadfruit and around the outside, they might grow your normal colocasia or common sort of taro. And that system is a very highly productive way. You've got four different uh, types of starch or carbohydrate rich crop, what they call in Fiji, kaka and dina. Uh, so it's a very uh, productive system that they've developed there in Rotuma. Uh, the, there's a saying in Rotuma, which is all my mum hay, which means a ripe breadfruit, but it also, the returns are quite, have some quite interesting and funny expressions. And it also means it's something that's done so often it stops being enjoyable. They could be talking about <laughs> something else or they could be talking about eating breadfruit, but it highlights the importance of uh, food and fruit preservation by fermentation, drying other methods um, and the importance of growing different varieties. So you've got complementary fruit uh, production and seasonality. One thing that we found in Fiji was that these uh, marionensis hybrids fill in a gap in the year where the other breadfruits aren't fruiting. So they are very important. If you want to run a, a breadfruit business where you're making a gluten-free flour, you want to have year-round production. And those uh, marionensis hybrids from the Northern Pacific, they, they've gotten into Fiji through Rambi. The people that came down from Kiribati brought them into Rambi. Uh, and they're there and they're, they're, they're there at CPAC in the SPC. Uh, they are, are very important for filling out the year in terms of uh, breadfruit production. Just uh, mentioned about uh, Adelino's there. So I think Ponape's got this, I haven't ever seen it, but it's got this amazing uh, traditional system where they, they, they document over 120 useful plants and many different cultivars. Uh, quite high yields of, of breadfruit considering it's a low input system because they're using different uh, different diverse uh, cultivars. They've got year-round production. Uh, this is an example of that uh, hybrid. The, 
the hybrids between marionensis and ulcerous, they can often be told because they've got asymmetric or unusual shaped fruits, often quite long fruits. They're very different and their the skin can be different too. Um, I'm almost at the end. This is in Kiribus, uh, once again, showing on the left-hand side, the marionensis hybrid, the Tme Kiang. Uh, maybe the skin looks like a, the scales of a turtle. That's on Butari Tari Atoll. Uh, breadfruit, very important there, but you can see with climate change, uh, this is a, on the right hand, you can see, uh, uh, that's Kinai, she's the head of agriculture in uh, uh, Kiribati, but there's a tree there that's been damaged when a king tide. So the water, the, the seawater came right over there and would have stayed for a number of maybe six or eight hours. And the, the, the killed a lot of breadfruit trees. You can see that one's slowly recovering, but breadfruit, uh, you can say that they're a salt tolerant non halophyte So they have a little bit of salt tolerance, but if you combine flooding uh, with salinity, they will be killed uh, because they haven't, they can't utilize the active systems to keep salt out of the, the root system. Uh, so that they're, they're doing work in Kiribati, uh, introducing different varieties. I think we really need to, with uh, increasing sea levels and increasing king tides and things, we need to do more work on salt tolerance in breadfruit. That would be very easy to do. And we would no doubt we would find some very good varieties that could partly tolerate that hypoxia the, where they're flooded as well as uh, salinity. Uh, there's a saying that money doesn't grow on trees, but in Samoa, trees grow on money. The number one tree to grow money on money is breadfruit. So, uh, I'm happy to take any questions later. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I just want to say one thing about uh, agroforestry systems. Because of the increase in uh, these Category 5 cyclones, I think we, we really look, need to look at developing, at least in the South uh, Pacific, systems that are more resistant to these category four or five cyclones. And I think, for example, I'm finishing on Samoa. Samoa has a tree called Terminalia richii or Malili, which is definitely the most cyclone tolerant tree in the world. That was shown when uh, uh, cyclone, uh, I'm forgetting, there were a couple in the early nineties there, uh, Ofer and Val came through. And then we, we had Heta and we've had other category fives, the mature trees and the young trees all can survive a direct hit from a Category 5 cyclone, and it's quite remarkable. Of the hundreds of tree species, Terminale richii is the only one. So I would think if we can convince Samoa to share their germplasm, I would think Terminale richii is a fabulous tree to be grown in all uh, South Pacific agroforestry systems. Where, And also things like bamboo. We're working on an agribusiness compendium for bamboo. We've done one for breadfruit. I'm hoping that will be loaded up at the Breadfruit People website. Uh, but bamboos, they may be flattened by the cyclone, but they can quickly recover and provide multiple products. So we need to make that. And, and things like casuarine equisita folia provides a fantastic windbreak. It can be managed. Uh, we need to be incorporating those sorts of uh, aspects into our uh, agroforestry systems. I think Craig's going to talk more about more properly, better planned and more actively managed agroforestry systems. So, so I'll end there. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lex. That was very, very interesting. Um, and I so appreciate you putting that together for us. Um, so now we're in an interesting uh, situation here. We're, we're almost to the end of our, our time. And um, I'm supposed to speak. And we also have over 20 questions in the, in the Q&A um, uh, field. So, Auntie Shirley just handed me one of her signature ulu dishes right here. This is ulu, which variety? This is maopo ulu with coconut cream and fresh grated coconut. So I'm just going to let you watch me eat a little bit of this. Well, I think about what the most polite thing to do would be now. Jared. Does anybody have any guidance? Jared. Auntie Shirley? Share. What? Share. Thank 
Let's it's see. been, you know, they say that over an hour is a long time for a webinar. I'd be happy to share briefly some thoughts on uh, agroforestry design that we've been working on. And, um, but that leaves the Q&A session um, a little bit short on time. So, what do you think? About what? About my sharing or Q&A? Mm. Okay. okay. Auntie Shirley says, let's do both. So if anybody needs to leave at half past the hour, we'll understand completely. If that works, does that work for the rest of the presenters? Father, hetero, Peter. Lex? Uh, yeah, correct. Uh, will work for me. Okay. Big Craig. Pardon? Will work. Okay. okay. So I'm going to then give you a brief presentation. So, so one of the puzzles that I've been working on and many other people have been working on for a long time here in Hawaii is um, how to develop complex agroforestry systems in the wake of um, the destruction of monoculture plantation agriculture and also unmanaged uh, pasture. I want to acknowledge that the real masters of agroforestry are those very quiet and humble people of the Pacific and around the world who have been doing agroforestry for thousands of years. This is knowledge that is passed on generationally and it's passed on through experience. So you really learn how to do this as a child. And just by watching and doing and developing skills of observation. And so not having grown up in these systems myself, I've had uh, to rely upon so many people to help me learn uh, how these systems work and how we can emulate them. And in the case of disturbed ecosystems such as in Hawaii or many other islands of the Pacific, bring them back into active use. So I use this example of a Samoan agroforest. If you ever have a chance to go to Samoa, you'll see that the islands are completely covered with, still covered with very biodiverse agroforestry systems in the lowland agricultural areas and then the uplands are quite a bit preserved in native forest. So this is a lovely Samoan agroforest, which happens to be a great example for breadfruit agroforestry. You can see breadfruit in the, in the middle story of this multi-story system. And uh, above it, there's coconuts and pomuli and below it, cacao and uh, a little bit of noni growing underneath it. So this is a multi-layer example system. This is a commercial system and it's obviously managed. Uh, you can see that the breadfruit trees have been recently pruned. Um, so this is a, a great model that we can learn from as are many of the uh, models we've seen from presenters and from traveling around the Pacific. Uh, and, and try to learn about the principles behind this that make it work and make this structure uh, so common, even though species may differ from region to region, the structure 
the diversity of species and the spacing is very similar wherever you go. When we started working on breadfruit about 10 years ago here in Hawaii, Anthony Shirley and I, Diane Rigoni, Andrea Dean and many others, um, we promoted breadfruit and agroforestry first and foremost. But in my naivete, I, I didn't realize that people were going to immediately put it into monocultures such as this one. And as we all know, monocultures have a number of problems. Uh, we have great loss of <coughs> soil and nutrients through erosion. We have loss of water through erosion and also through uh, evaporation from the soil surface. <clears throat> we have degradation of soil. So this is a, a system which is in a, a state of degradation, you might say, which we compensate for by adding uh, fertilizer, we add nutrients, uh, we add water for as irrigation water as needed. And so we compensate for the deficiencies that we are ourselves creating. And so when we're looking at um, building resilient and uh, productive um, replacements for monoculture, whether it's uh, sugarcane or coffee or any number of monocultures, we, we wanna look at characteristics that benefit that are that are beneficial that the monocultures do not do not provide so in this table here all of these beneficial services are provided by multi-story agroforestry um, and they are not provided by monocultures and i'll just repeat what many of our speakers have said from last uh, webinar monocultures are also um, grounds where pests and disease can spread. So we've seen that in banana worldwide and coffee and many other crops. We want to avoid that for our breadfruit. So for a long time, we've all been talking about sustainability. Sustainability means we maintain the status. We don't go backwards. We just maintain the status. And that no longer suffices. We know now, particularly in our degraded landscapes, um, that um, we need to regenerate. Everything we do needs to improve the status, the status of soil, the status of biodiversity, the status of um, resilience. So regenerative agriculture is uh, the, the, new, the new mantra that we need to be following in, in my opinion and many of my colleagues' opinion. So what is regenerative ag uh, agroforestry? Well, we draw from regenerative agriculture principles, which are these five. You can read about them in the literature for regenerative agriculture. Essentially, it's uh, improving soil over time, improving water retention and percolation, improving biodiversity, <laughs> improving ecosystem health and sequestering carbon. So the key to our design strategy is to design our agroforestry systems in ways that are measurable, in ways that we can, um, that, that we can measure and plan uh, that imparts these regenerative outcomes. So if we can, design our agroforestry systems in certain ways that fill certain measurable standards, we can get these benefits automatically. These are outcomes. And so we wrote a paper a couple of years ago. Uh, if you just look up Elevich, Mazzaroli, and Rigoni, I did this with Nikki Mazzaroli and Diane Rigoni. Um, you can see our, our suggested principles, measurable principles, um, which you can use in your design strategies. So these are the four principles. The first being integration, the presence of trees, 
which we're doing already uh, because we're doing agroforestry. And that imparts many of the outcomes that we are looking for. The density, we want a certain minimum density of perennials. The number of species, so we want a certain amount of biodiversity in our system as a minimum. And we also want structural diversity. So we want diversity of strata and structure in our systems. I'm going to go through this quickly because you, you can refer to the paper for the, some detail on this. I'm also going to show you a design tool that we have put online that's free for use to design your systems according to these standards. So um, one of the things I'm going to use here is um, the, the concept of different layers or strata of the forest and we color code those. Uh, so the emergent uh, trees are in blue. Those are the trees that are widely spaced and stick up out of the forest um, above most everything else. And then we have the highs. Those are the ones that get lots of light, um, but uh, don't, don't like to be, uh, get too much shade. So perhaps up to 20% um, shade. Then there's the mediums in yellow, they take more shade, and then the lows, which take the most shade. And at the bottom, we have the ground layer. So let's look back at our, our Samoan system, which I showed you. If you look at this, it, it's uh, a little bit complicated to the untrained eye. But if we overlay our canopy layers onto that, we can begin to see the the structure, the diversity, and the density of species. And so the emergence, the blues, are coconuts and pomuli in this uh, in this system. Um, the high, the greens, are all breadfruit. The mediums are cacao and banana, and the lows are the um, the noni. I didn't mention kava before but that's in the understory here as well. And so we have the beginnings of a design. We have the, the, the beginnings of um, kind of putting things together structurally in terms of density and diversity. But there is a bit of a challenge here and I didn't put the slide in here, but these systems are very hard to teach on paper and they're hard to plan on paper, especially for people who have not or not used to uh, uh, complex systems like this. So um, we adopt a strategy of planting a multi-story agroforest in rows, which is much easier to con conceptually understand. And if, you, if, you're, if you're good at this, it makes it easier to explain what you're doing. So this is um, a, uh, an example planting layout, which you can find in the tool, agroforestryx.com, where we have, these are all color-coded uh, planting positions. The greens are high again, the yellows are medium, the reds are low, and the blues are our um, are emergence. The thing about this is a lot of people will plant an agroforest like this based on their experience with monocultures, but they become very frustrated because now you have a very diverse system which requires a lot of maintenance until you get your yields from the long-term plants. So we really, uh, you can see the photo on the right-hand side, you have a lot of space between the trees They've actually had to construct windbreaks so the trees are not protected. Trees that would normally come up in the understory as young trees are not protected, they're exposed. And you have a lot of work and maintenance. So for a few years, all you're doing is working and spending money and time. So we wanna fill in the gaps. So the medium term plants, what we call medium term, are those plants that we will have there for a few years. So things like papayas, cassava, taro, pineapples. They'll be there for a few years, but then they'll disappear. So on the left-hand side here, you see the long-term plants. 
And on the right-hand side, you see the medium-term plans. If you put those together, and these are, again, illustrations from the design tool. Uh, if you put those together, you start seeing your rows of multi-story agroforests take shape. That's the darker green rows here. And those are essentially um, uh, complete uh, multi-story systems from very early in the succession, in the in, soon after planting, um, you have medium-term plants come up and long-term plants uh, after the medium terms uh, fade away, the long-term plants take over. And in between these rows, these densely placed rows, we have our uh, pathways, those are mowed, or they can also be cropped, or they can be used for organic matter production, which they, they should be used in, in those ways. So just to um, um, help you uh, use this kind of strategy, uh, our tool is called the Agroforestry Design Tool. It's free, it's available at agroforestryx.com. We were supported by the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service in building this tool and making it available to everyone. And it is for the Pacific Islands. So the species um, and the planting patterns are all for Pacific species. And the tool allows you to select your planting patterns, select your species based on your environment, um, determine your pruning sizes, and it also vis helps you visualize, including with animations, the progression of your agroforest over time. We also have an instru instructional webinar that we uh, recorded, and you can, you can find it on the support page at agroforestryx.com. So thank you very much for your time. I know it's getting late. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions on that. So let's go to questions. Again, if anybody needs to um, leave, we will understand completely. It's already been an hour and a half. Um, and so we will start taking questions. Would you mind bringing your computer over here? Um, Zoom is for some reason not providing me with the questions. Okay, so um, we have a question um, from Seise Moli Mouse Amazoni. Do you have any thoughts on strategies that could be used to increase breadfruit flower uptake by our Pacific peoples? And uh, can we have, who would like to take that? Oh, uh, Father Pedro, would you like to take that one? What's the question again? Uh, uh, it's um, strategies for increasing breadfruit flower consumption and adoption. for increasing flower. Oh, 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 I would say, um, uh, I believe the more uh, raw materials, uh, then we'll have uh, an increase in uh, the flower productions. But the orchard, uh, to do it in orchard type, will be good. Uh, incorporating the regenerative uh, agroforestry, uh, that will be a way forward blending those two. Um, any, anyone else, um, Peter or Lex, uh, like to address that one? I think the, the one of the important things is how you dry the breadfruit. And if you can get uh, a good solar drying system or in Tutu, they're lucky they've got uh, mini, mini hydro uh, that provides uh, a very good renewable source and cheap source of power. But uh, yeah, being able to uh, hygienically and efficiently dry your breadfruit was really, and you can have quite simple solar uh, dryers, but that's really critical to being able to economically produce uh, breadfruit flour. So 
it can be very difficult if you're in a, an area where it's constantly raining and cloudy, uh, then you might need some form of electric dryers, but otherwise the uh, solar ones would be the way to go. Thank you. Um, okay, let's. Um, here's a question, a very general question. Um, can we meet the demand with current supply? Peter or Father Federal? Uh, in the future, I don't think so. There'll be um, because there's more uh, like in the in the, the Pacific, South Pacific. Uh, there's more in uh, the wild. We need to change that. Um, most families they don't have even a planted a breadfruit tree. I think uh, we, we can't. Eh? Can, I, can I add on to that, Father Patera? I, I think that, yeah, it's, uh, there's certainly nowhere near enough uh, planted breadfruit resource to supply what could be the global demand. I mean, even for things like, for example, in Samoa, they made a, a beer, um, um, <laughs> but they make a beautiful beer called Vilema, and they made a gluten-free one with breadfruit flour, but they just, they had to, they just did it for a few months and they stopped because there wasn't enough. The same with Deke's Bakery. They would take almost all the breadfruit flour they could get, but there's just not enough. Being, and they're just one bakery chain, yeah? <laughs> uh, there's no, you know, the, the global demand for at the right price, you can't be selling breadfruit flour for, you know, maybe 10 US dollars a kilogram and have a, a great market. But if you could produce it for two or three, US dollars a kilogram, for example, I'm talking a bit off the top of my head, if you could do that, there'd be a huge demand out there for gluten-free products because we know apart from people that have uh, gluten intolerance, celiac, there are a whole, a much larger cohort of people who tend not to want to have, uh, they, they, they sort of get mildly sick or don't feel well when they're eating products with gluten in. So there's a huge demand out there for gluten-free uh, breadfruit flour and also the protein uh, composition is very good for vegetarians. It has leucine and lysine and things that often vegetarians struggle to get enough in their diet. So breadfruit flour is a good one. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Kyle, I'm wondering if you're available for um, a couple of questions. Yes, absolutely. Okay, wonderful. We do have a question here. I'll just mention before you, uh, I, I'm, I, I, I'd say the question. Um, this is a series of webinars. So in terms of product development, I see a lot of questions about breadfruit flour. We will have a whole webinar just on um, breadfruit dehydration and flour. So um, we, we, you know, we, we will have some of the experts in the world on that topic um, join us for that webinar, then we can answer those questions in detail later. Um, but I would like to um, pass on the question to you, Kyle. Um, and this relates to the breadfruit people and its activities and networking and PFON. Um, I, this is from Talemo Waka. I'm a farmer in Vitilevu. Um, any, uh, any contact point to work with uh, around the Gabuilevu research station area. So maybe, maybe you could take that more as a generic question about finding um, research partners and uh, extension partners and that kind of thing. Yeah, okay, great. Well, um, so obviously one of the hats uh, that I wear is uh, with the Pacific Island Farm Organization Network. So we really encourage farmers to, uh, to work together and to uh, be a part of organizations. And um, uh, in Fiji, we have a number of organizations um, that are uh, working either directly or indirectly with uh, breadfruit. Um, uh, none that I know of directly in, in Ra, but certainly um, a lot of the research that uh, uh, we uh, have uh, highlighted on our breadfruit people was done through Nature's Way Cooperative uh, in Nandi. And of course, um, uh, your, uh, your uh, brothers in, uh, in Tavuni, which uh, uh, have shared a little bit 
they're a little bit farther away. Uh, but I think in general, we uh, encourage you to connect through the Breadfruit people, through the Facebook page, read through some of the champions and the resources. And um, really, this is just about connecting people. And so I think, uh, um, you know, that kind of request is exactly what we're hoping to address through Breadfruit people is to is to be a marriage broker to help connect people and uh, and connect resources. Um, but apart from that, uh, as I said, um, uh, these issues that we're facing, uh, the uh, access to inputs, access to to uh, technical materials, this is where we believe uh, being part of a farm farm organizations, forming a farm organizations, partnering with government. Uh, whether it be the extension division or the research division, these are the, the, the way forward for, for all of us. Um, so please send us a message on Facebook uh, or through uh, the email and, and we, can, uh, we can try and uh, uh, connect you all up. And I also just wanted to kind of add, we, uh, we are making these webinars in, um, uh, on different subjects, but as you can see from our presenters, Nobody can just talk about one aspect of it. Uh, even our uh, agroforestry guru there, Craig, had to eat some breadfruit. And, um, and I think that that uh, is just uh, demonstrating how, how interconnected uh, what we do with this crop is. And so um, as we try to bring specific subject matter, uh, of course, we'll continue to loop around and uh, uh, at all of the aspects of breadfruit. But uh, thank, just want to say thank you to the presenters and, uh, and also to... Just to highlight, the, the website is live. Uh, it's only going to be as good as the, the contributions that we get from all of you. Uh, so we believe in open source sharing of information with proper accreditation. Uh, so uh, please, if you're willing to share some of your research, uh, some of your uh, lessons, some of your videos, um, uh, send it through to us and we will make sure that we credit it and help connect you with uh, the rest of our network. Thank you. Wonderful. I noticed, Lex, you raised your hand. Would you like to address that? Can I just add to that? Uh, firstly, about the uh, number we live with, that area in Ra is just ideal for growing breadfruit. It's perfect. It's rocky. It's volcanic. And also for drying breadfruit, you've got a lot of sun in that area. So it's in that intermediate rainfall zone, which is a really happy medium for growing breadfruit and then processing it. So, yeah, that breadfruit will grow really well there. Uh, just with regards to in the Party 2, ACR Party 2 project with uh, Kyle and others, we produced a, a manual on uh, an agribusiness compendium and module four of that uh, is purely about breadfruit processing, making the flour, there are spreadsheets on financial models and all sorts of things, the technical information. So I'm not sure Kyle might want to add, if, if, is, are the uh, modules of the agribusiness uh, breadfruit compendia on the breadfruit people website absolutely yeah it's uh, it's kind of a backbone of a lot of the content um okay so that's a key partnership so definitely please uh, please take some time to look around there's a whole lot of uh, material and uh, uh some of it um hasn't really uh, been shared around too widely uh, as the, the work that uh, Dr. Lex has just mentioned. So it's it's up on the breadfruitpeople.com. Thanks for sharing, Lex. Thank you. Uh, we have a question uh, directed to you, Peter. Uh, the question is, is there a rainy season in Vanuatu? Is it at the same time as the breadfruit season? uh craig yes in my presentation it's 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 about the same day where you have the rain as well as the breadfruit so uh it's not easy i see i see thank you for that if, even 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 more worse uh it's around the yeah. cyclone season so that's 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 how we are I see, a whole new level of difficulty then. Um, so there are a couple of questions about uh, propagation. And again, we will have a whole webinar on propagation um, with uh, people who have really studied that as well as um, would like to share the, the latest and greatest methods. So, um, 
but uh, perhaps we could address one of these. Um, uh, one is, um, this is Dr. Girard. How, how much success can be expected if stem cuttings are used as propagules? Any hormonal treatment recommended for more success? And also grafting seedless varieties onto seeded varieties, such as uh, Kamansi. Uh, 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 and um, is that success, successful and are those graphs compatible? Would you like to uh, take that, Lex? Yeah, no, sorry, I didn't get the whole question, but it was more, I think that breadfruit uh, grafting, it, it's not its not the easiest uh, plant to, to graft because of the amount of uh, that exudate and the sap, but uh, there's no problem with grafting of, uh, I've never heard of, of incompatibility between wild types of uh, breadfruit and the more domesticated forms, but I would think that if possible, you're better to go for for marcotting uh, because of the fact that uh, you end up with a, the stature of the plant is smaller. Uh, at the moment, we don't have, I don't think we have dwarfing rootstocks uh, for breadfruit, but that would be ideal if we could identify, you know, maybe that new species from Mal um, Maluku in Indonesia, maybe that'll be a, a dwarfing rootstock, who knows, but that's what we need to look at. Uh, otherwise, I think the Marcotting is the, uh, the preferred method of uh, propagating breadfruit to ensure that um, it's genetically the, uh, the same and uh, that you've got a smaller, smaller canopy, which is easy to harvest from. Because I've seen those breadfruits and I think Diane's shown, you know, you just walk around and you're just picking them like that instead of climbing up a 30 metre tree with a long pole and trying to work out which one's ripe. And it's, it's ridiculous, yeah? But, <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, well, uh, let me see what else we have here. I think maybe we're um, we're getting close to the end here. Um, more questions about breadfruit flower. We'll handle those. Um, does anybody have any final comments? I know, Kyle, uh, we, we have on the schedule that you would like to close. Can we show that image? Caitlin is going to show the image that you sent. Okay, yeah, not... Uh... Uh, not too much to say in the closing, but, uh, but really to just thank uh, all of the presenters and uh, uh, that, uh, of course the recording of this uh, webinar will be available on the Breadfruit People uh, um, page and the YouTube channel, uh, uh, as will the um, presentations with permission from the presenters and some of the presenters have also uh, um, allowed for their um, contact details to, uh, to be shared in case you have some uh, specific questions or want to follow up uh, with them. Um, yeah, but I just want to uh, encourage you to uh, uh, be a part of it. Um, check us out on breadfruitpeople.com. Uh, check us out on uh, our Facebook page. Um, uh, subscribe so that you can receive uh, our e-bulletins. Uh, and please, uh, please uh, contact us, uh, connect send through some materials so that we can uh, keep growing this big breadfruit family. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to extend my thanks to all of the presenters, Kalani Souza, Auntie Shirley, who's right here, and all of you on the screen right now. It's been a great joy to be with you. It's been really a, a, a wonderful thing to connect over all of these um, distances, but we share so much together. And thank you all to all of the attendees for hanging in there uh, this long.